Hey guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall. And today I have Dr. Mike back on the show and I get a bit of an update on him. Is he cutting? Is he massing? That develops into a discussion around the competitive landscape of enhanced and natural bodybuilding. And then I ask a listener question, which relates to, will Mike be going into educational content surrounding drug use and that sort of thing? And that again develops into some further discussion and I think some really great practical take homes for you the listeners and as a reminder if you didn't stick through the whole episode as you'll get a reminder of this at the end of the episode when we try and sell you on the amazing experience that will be the london vip experience where we have tickets available where you can book in for sessions with myself with pascal jared mike and nick shaw from renaissance periodization and we take you through gnarly private one-on-one sessions that will be sessions of a lifetime memories of a lifetime and there's very very limited tickets for these they typically sell out very quickly they may even be sold out i'm recording this ahead of time and so if there are tickets left there's probably not very many so definitely get on those we look forward to seeing you there we always love doing these events and it's going to be a great time so let's get into the chat with mike Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall. And today I have Dr. Mike Isretel back on the show. I was just looking, it felt like it had been a while since we'd had a, a one-on-one chat, Mike. Um, probably, I don't know, for you, I feel like you're so busy, time probably just flies. You're like, where's all this time going? Uh, not to say that I'm not that busy, but I doubt I'm as busy as you. But it's been three months. That's a roundabout way of saying it's been three months and I needed some mic time. So I'm glad we could get this this going again. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to be on, Steve. And you're, so I'm aware, you're around 235 pounds. You're dieting at the moment. Uh, give us an update on what's happening on you and your kind of physique endeavors. Yeah. So I started my diet about a month ago, a little over a month ago. I started at about 234 pounds. Um, At the end of this weekend, I will be about 241 pounds because that's how anabolics work. (laughs) Uh, Wacky, wacky stuff. And um, I'm getting really, really lean because I started lean. And um, it's looking really cool. So... I've got uh, another 12 weeks of dieting. Uh, And then I step on stage at the Masters Nationals in uh, Pittsburgh in the United States and Pennsylvania. And uh, I'm trying to make the heavyweight. I'm trying. I will be in the heavyweight class, um, 225 pounds, roughly just over 100 kilos. And uh, it's going to be cool. I'm trying to get... I'm on track to get to the point where, so the show is in mid to late July, trying to get to the point where I'm really very, very contest ready by mid June. Um, It probably will happen even earlier than that. Then the rest of my time I will spend going from lean to nonsensical because I, I do have the size I'm five foot six. So I'm very big for uh, short for the heavyweight class. Uh, which is good because if I top out, then I'll, I'm, I'm going to have a hell of a time making to the top of the heavyweights. So I'll be at t- close to the top of the heavyweight class, body weight wise. My height is good, so I carry a lot of muscle mass. My lines aren't awful, but they're not that great. Uh, so in order to have a chance of winning, I have to come peeled to the bone. Now, of course, peeled to the bone is the best chance anyone has at winning, but some people can get pretty lean and do really well because they have amazing lines, but I don't. So I have to just get nonsense shredded. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing that. I'm excited for that as well. Cause I know, and as you would hope this as a competitor, it's always nice to see someone get better every time they compete and not just more muscle mass, but you're coming in better in every sense of that word. So last time you had lines in your glutes. So I'm only imagining there's, there's more lines to be in the glutes. <laughs> I want to look like a walnut. That's yes. the idea. <laughs> just post a picture of a walnut in my bathroom and then a week before just crush it up. You know, like that's it. It's do like you think the Rocky you, scene. Yeah. Do you think uh 
do you think you've been lean enough to kind of have that, but you're the dynamics, obviously you mentioned their water weight due to anabolics. I know that's always been something that's challenging for you. Do you think it, you've maybe had that condition there? You just haven't been able to show it before. And now you have the kind of uh, experience to be able to do that. Yeah. In my last show, when I took second in the super heavies, I was probably a pretty long shot, the leanest super heavy and probably one of the leaner people in the show. Uh, but, uh, and I did get my water stuff pretty good then. Um, I can push my water further. Obviously, there's a risk of death, so I don't want to push it too far. I've, I'm pretty far away from too far. Uh, I'll tell you this. When I got off stage at my last show, I had, had like a cup of water. And I was like, eh. I just had a couple more cups. And I was like, eh. And then I went and took a shower and felt totally fine. Then on the ride home, which was like four hours because we were driving from Arizona to Las Vegas, I had a lot of fluids and I didn't pee until the next morning. <laughs> so I was like, oh, shit. Okay. I was fairly dehydrated, but um, so I was pretty dry. But uh, I could have been leaner. And um, there is a point at which in bodybuilding, you get lean enough to look really, really good. And people start telling you you're ready and it's your leanest ever. What I'm interested in now at this point in my career is what happens if you, if you diet for another month after that, because that's what separates people who are lean from the guy that takes the shirt off backstage and everyone's like, Jesus Christ, what the hell is that? And that's what I want to go for because I, um, Bodybuilding competition, I don't very much enjoy. Uh, I hate the smell. The tanning stuff smells awful. It's a, the whole thing is this giant charade. It's, you know, like uh, it, the showmanship is really cool. What the audience sees is really cool. It's just awesome that like judges even decide to spend their time sitting there for six hours judging us. But um, all the prep and the tanning and the traveling, it's like, eh. Um, but so I, I compete because I have something to prove and, uh, I'm absolutely zero interest in showing anything other than my best by a long shot. And that's what it's going to take for me to do the kind of justice to my stage appearance that I want. And, uh, this time I'm very well set up for it. So, um, that's kind of my perspective on the matter. Yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. And I like the having to talk about judging. I, I got to judge a couple of shows last year and I'm going to be doing a couple this year. It's a long day and show days like as a judge is it's way less of a pain in the ass because I mean, you can eat and you're there and you're just sitting down. Whereas as a competitor, like the, the show days are normally very, very long. It's like challenging, yeah. what have you. So I totally uh, get you on that. And also kind of judging really gave me a respect for like symmetry versus conditioning and muscularity and kind of what you're looking for as a judge and balancing that. And at least from my perspective, I don't watch the enhanced scene as closely as mate, probably yourself, Mike, but at least from what I saw, at least in the enhanced side, it was more muscularity condition really kind of was held a little stronger than lines, whereas uh, kind of the lines being symmetry within natural bodybuilding, at least from my perspective, I might be, I'm probably biased because I don't have symmetry or lines to, to kind of hold uh. to my name. And so I feel like actually uh, maybe a natural bodybuilding condition was favored, but now people know how to get shredded glutes. And now actually it's gone back to more symmetry based. So I don't know if, if you feel like the enhanced side is more like condition is really heavily favored or muscularity versus the symmetry. I think muscularity on the enhanced side isn't favored very much because plenty of people are jacked. I think what I would say is there's nuance to this, but uh, I would say it seems to me just observing it that if I had to build a model intellectually of how enhanced judging looks, I would say it's a, a four-tiered sort of gated system where passing through one tier gets you to the next tier but if you don't pass one tier you just it's irrelevant so tier one 
and so you can say the bottom of the hierarchy is conditioning. If you don't have great conditioning, it doesn't really matter how big you are, how um, much symmetry you have and flow, or how good your posing is. Conditioning is the bottom entry point. The guys that are all in really good shape, we can say comparable shape, they get to the next tier, which seems to be muscularity. And the guys with the most muscle in that tier get to the next tier, or at least they're reordered. So for example, if you get, uh, it actually works literally in tiers because you have people coming out and then they're separated into groups, right? Into call outs. So first call out is everyone that's in the best conditioning, it's flat out. In that call out, the guys move to the center when they're most muscular. Then within that grouping, they move people around and move further people to the center next that are uh, most uh, symmetrical or whatever you call it, flow proportionality. And then the last thing is posing. But posing, I would even say, is not its own tier, but is a way, it's actually, I would say, there's just three tiers, uh, really. There's conditioning, then there's muscularity, then there is um, symmetry flash, slash physique flow, whatever the hell Flex Wheeler had, that, <laughs> however you like to call it. And um, then posing is never really judged by itself uh, unless uh, it's bad, like actively terrible. Actually, my, this is a bit off color, but my dad once, I was uh, bothering my dad when I was younger because he gets really awkward about serious talks. And I was like, dad, you know, it is important for a guy to have like, like a big, you know what, <laughs> you know, to put a big dick to please a woman. And he goes, Misha, it's not a problem unless it is small. And that's kind of like... <laughs> It's got, you know, actually women will tell you that. They're like, I don't need you to be the king of the world. Like, if you're just average, it's probably going to work out great. So that's the same thing with posing. Like, if your posing is competent, you're good to go. If it's bad, you're actually, and here's the part about posing, that posing is um, a, a sort of biasing factor in all of the other ones. If you're really conditioned, but you don't know how to squeeze your glutes in the rear double bi, like, they might, the judges don't even actually know that you have glute striations. So they're like, well, I guess he's not in that good of shape. Then you squeeze it for a second, and they're like, oh. And they, they, they pull you off, like, after the, after the prejudging, they'll be like, you need to work on squeezing your glutes and hams because you're shredded, but we can't tell. So, and then for muscularity, I mean, obviously how you pose can make you look bigger or smaller. And then for symmetry, huge, because good posing can hide your weak points, exaggerate your strong points, so on and so forth. So posing is actually kind of, kind of a bias factor applied to all three, but they do exist in that three-tiered hierarchy of uh, seemingly in, in a... Um, in bodybuilding, where conditioning is like, it's a conditioning contest first. And if you show up with bad conditioning or not quite the best conditioning in the show, you're not competing for first place anymore. It doesn't matter how big you are. It, it doesn't matter how good your posing is. It sure shit doesn't matter how good your symmetry is. You have to be sharp. Um, to put it this way, Keon Pearson, do you know who that is? Keon Prodigy on Instagram? Yes. He's the second coming of Flex Wheeler. He's made Insane. the best yeah. genetics for bodybuilding of all time. His front double buy is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in the world. I cry every time he does it. But the thing is, every now and again, he'll come off uh, a little off. And he's still shredded, but not quite sharp. They put him in like seventh. And in, in, yeah. it, that's where he belongs, uh, with most people tell you, in bodybuilding. If he came in completely shredded, it just would be no contest, no matter who he came up against. Like, short of, like, Derek Lunsford, who looks exactly like a white version of him. But, yeah. like, uh, you know what I mean? Like, Derek Lunsford's genetics also just just unreal. Yeah. Like, what, how is your waist still this big? And the rest of you is like a Dorito. But uh, it, it's, it's that tiered system is what, to me, seems like judging looks like. Um, and it explains pretty much all the variance in judging, short of like weird calls that no one agrees with, because you'll get guys uh, that will, uh, you know, some guy who weighs 260 will lose to a guy who's like, I've seen actually lose to people that weigh like 185. And the guy's like, how is that possible? You're like, that 185 pounder has negative 10% body fat as far as I can tell. And that 260 guy is like in good shape, but when they put the two together and they turn around and they hit their back double by and rear double and, and everything like that, uh, lat spread, and you see the glutes or you don't see the glutes, or you see the hams, you don't see the hams, you see the lower back serrations or you don't, it's just very crystal clear. And as a judge, you probably know this, when someone really, really shredded goes up against almost anyone else, 
you just kind of like look up to the other judges you're like this is only one person here that's winning the show it's that guy and you can tell instantly steve by the way since you're a judge and i'm not um uh i've heard people say that judging uh, competition especially high level is like the hardest thing in the world i, I think i disagree with that in, entirely because judging bodybuilding competition is actually usually very apparent especially at a local level high level it's more difficult because everyone's good in a certain way but at a local level or regional level it's kind of pretty obvious when the guys come out you're like that these two guys did not diet these two guys are fine these two guys are the guys going up against each other they turn around you're like that's number one that's number two and all the other poses they hit mandatories this and that it's kind of irrelevant like they could do two poses and you'd be like i know exactly who's winning the show yeah, what do you think about that is that a bad take yeah, I, I don't think that's, I mean, hardest thing in the world. Uh, it, it's challenging when there's a big class and there's no clear outstanding individuals. So I actually tend to find like more novice classes a little bit more challenging because everyone's got a little bit of something, but something else is missing and their posing isn't great. Yeah, and so it's sense. a bit harder to kind of compare them and then put them in placings. And you haven't got much time and there's a lot of people on stage and you're trying to score them and look up and they're hitting poses. So that can be challenging. But uh, on the higher level, yeah, normally there's like first, second, third gets, and then you, it gets a bit challenging after that, but you can normally tell, especially like when you're at that high level, you're almost looking for weaknesses on people versus strengths. Cause yes. I mean, they're, they're already very good. So you're just looking who's got things that I can pick off that are not so great. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Just to put uh, um, kind of an example to it, Mick Shaw, our PCO, competed uh, last year at a, a show, first first show in like 10 years. I mean, he won his class and a bunch of other stuff. He didn't get the overall. He was clearly second place in the overall. He lost the overall to a guy. Nick weighed in, uh, barely weighed in at 198, and he had completely striated glutes and just a thin film of water. He just wasn't dry enough, but he visibly just like strided everything. The guy who beat him had probably similar conditioning, but was dry and crisp. That guy maybe weighed, I mean, I came up and congratulated him. He looked great. He maybe weighed like 135. He was like five wow. foot four. His upper body was very small. He had big legs. I mean, Nick's everything was bigger than that guy. Side to some comparison, there was just like a, 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 a child and his father. <laughs> and then both had striations. But that guy was just a tiny bit crisper. And it was like, boom, that's it. He won. That, that's just how they did it. And it was, it's that extreme, Steve, in, in, the, in the NPC. It, like, it is a conditioning contest, first and foremost. And then if by some odd chance you have two guys that are equally conditioned, the more muscular guy will win. And if the more muscular guy is really odd, terrible shape or big legs, but a tiny upper body, relatively speaking, then the guy with better symmetry will win. And if they all have just about the same everything, the guy who's a more competent poser will win. But to be honest, I've never seen anyone win on posing ever. There's never time when I was like, that guy won because he can pose well. Like, no. Right. And I mean this with all, all due respect. This man is a god. He's not even a man. Ronnie Coleman never really posed all that well, bro. Like some poses he hit, you were like, Didn't what is to. that? <laughs> like, he never really got dinged for it. Flex Wheeler was like, a, reinvented the art of posing. Never beat Ronnie. <laughs> yeah. Why? This is actually only one reason. Flex could never, against Ronnie, bring deeply strided glutes. If Flex Wheeler did that shit once, he'd be Mr. Olympia. That's how extreme the conditioning bias is, plain and simple. Yeah. It didn't used to be like that. Back in the 80s, uh, they looked at all other kinds of stuff. But the 90s, with the, the middle of the Dorian era, it became a conditioning contest. And I'll say this, I'm not even really against that. I'm kind of neutral on it, value-wise. Like, oh, do you think... Because you'll, you'll, you'll see guys being like Arnold actually himself said. He was like, at some point a few years back, he was like, what is bodybuilding? It's just a conditioning contest with mass monsters. Where's the art? Where are the lines? I hear that 100%, and I'm totally willing to be like, yeah, no, I, that, I agree with that. But at the same time, there's something, especially in real life, to seeing someone hit a nasty back shot with everything just like cleared and cut in. And you're just like, I don't know what it is. That guy won, bro. I don't care what the contest is. That's special. And that's freaky and it's undeniable. They can even regular people will be like, you'll show them someone who's really lean and they'll be like, wow. And then you'll show them like, uh, you know, someone with completely peeled out glutes, and they're just going to be like, 
what is that? There's some fast, it's, it's, it's wild to see in real life. So I'm not against that being like the pinnacle of the sport, but if they decided like, look, we're just straight up, not looking at glutes anymore. We're going to judge everything else. Cool. I will say that that probably judges more genetically gifted people than otherwise. Um, the, the, the whole like judging symmetry and shape because shape symmetry, et cetera, that flex wheeler stuff, that's way more genetic than how lean you can get. Uh, there are absolutely genetics to how lean you can get, but most people with an applied long-term caloric deficit can get very, very, very lean. And it's just a matter of, at some point, just grit, you know? Um, it's like you just wake up and do the same thing every day, and you don't even know what your own name is anymore. You just wake up and do the same thing every day, and about three weeks later, you have veins in between your glutes rations, and people are like, how did you do it? And you're like, I don't even know what's going on. I just go stand on stage and do this. Okay. <laughs> I, I love how just to reflect upon you kind of mentioned the tears and if, like posing absolutely just influences all of them. Like you could have great symmetry, but I mean, I've seen it's frustrating to some extent, but nice in some ways when, and it speaks to Ronnie Coleman's genetics, the fact that his posing didn't have to be just like spot on for him to have won so many times. But when you see other competitors where you're like, man, you don't even need to really hit this front relaxed, like half well and you still look like you got better shape than me and i'm just like man i'm spent like so long trying to dial this posing in Probably. but that's that's, that's how reality you maybe get sometimes a yeah um but yeah it's very interesting i i think that's that kind of reflects how i've seen the enhanced side go and I, like i said i think in the natural scene it was so much on the like shredded glutes kind of train and i think it's almost like reverted a bit back more really symmetry yeah is that just do you think is that, is that just in the uk scene or is that the world over or is it also in the states at least from a few of my clients this season i would say yeah, like it's across the board so not just uk but i would say uk scene that's how I've seen it go. But again, I'm probably biased a little bit. Sure. You know what, Steve? I'm going to write down really quick. That I'm going to make a YouTube video about how bodybuilding competition is judged because I've never actually talked about that outside of your channel. Three-tier gated system of lean, then muscular, then symmetry, and posing biases all of noted and then of course right. some judges have their own preferences for even poses uh for how conditioned you are and like do they prefer conditioning or do they prefer prefer the lines and you can't yep. get out of that subjectivity so like you know that's why you can stand in front of like one panel of judges and then stand in front of another one and do better because of just oh it's different people there so it's just part of the sport or sport, I have whatever. Heard, <laughs> yeah, I have heard a lot of stuff like that. Um, ever since Jared especially turned pro, um, you know, he tells me things of how things really work in the pro ranks and how things really work in various other organizations. And um, there's no conspiracy theory, really, in most cases. But there are definitely like, hey, they, this. if you go to this show and you get this judge as the head judge, he or she really loves mass monsters, but uh, or they really love shape or whatever. But at the same time, because I think the highest and lowest scores get thrown out anyway, and because um, th th there's a high degree of professionalism generally with judges, you can't pull off miracles almost ever. And the opposite of a miracle, which is like a great injustice, Almost every time, and and I and I do want to put a fine point on this. Almost every time, guys bitch online because that's what guys do about like man, this guy got robbed, bro. Almost every time you look at the pictures, like no, he didn't, motherfucker. This other guy's just better. You just like that guy, and it's really easy to accuse the sport of being biased and robbery and blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, like even the most biased judges and judges that have preferences, you could look at the lineup and be like, I might not agree exactly with this decision, but it's another valid way of looking at it. Like if you took the last Olympia and you took Hani, Hani, uh, Hani Chupan and Derek Lunsford and you flip flopped them, I don't think anyone would bat an eye. Um, so not, not really any wrong answers there, but 
uh, you know, it's not like somebody who was supposed to be in eighth place won the Mr. Olympia. Like you put either Hottie or Baron yeah. next to anyone else and you're like, holy shit, like that person is clearly very, very good. Um, it's happened before in some contexts where someone gets too high of a placing. Um, but then again, there's other explanatory factors. It's interesting because probably the closest I've ever of I've known. But back in the day, that's not the case. So to be perfectly frank, uh, I, this is not controversial. I think it was 1980 when Arnold came back and won the Mr. Olympia again, 80 or 81. Uh, he absolutely did not deserve to win the Mr. Olympia, uh, flat out. And, and everyone knew it. And he tried to like do his Arnold antics, like, hey, come on, let's pose down the big stage. Yeah. And then we're going to steal your underwear. Yeah. And like he tried to do that with Mike Menser. And Mike Menser was basically like, get the fuck out of my <laughs> face. And he was like, hey, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Um, then it was like, no, like, no, nobody playing any games with you, man. Like, this is fucking bullshit. That was for sure a thing. Like, that was fucking lame. But in the modern era, I'd say the closest that's ever come to that is when Dorian won like his last Olympia or two you could say make a case for that because like half the muscles weren't even on his body anymore he looked tired and depleted and there was like a bicep that was too short and a tricep that was half attached and you were like jesus christ he was still in shape like he was very well conditioned so you know you could definitely make a case for somebody else winning that and that was kind of like the 90s sort of golden era platinum era whatever you want to call it of like flex wheeler kevin lavron i mean legends right like god sean ray that the problem with that is if you have to really steel man the victory of Dorian uh, over those people towards the end of his career or, or red team the critique is none of those guys ever really came in with the whole package at the same time like Kevin Lavron one year was really good then the year he could have knocked Dorian off his legs were significantly downsized because he was dealing with injuries um you know Flax was really hit and miss Sean Ray was amazing, but he weighed 207 pounds on stage or something like that. Uh, and that's his reported weight. Uh, he might have weighed less than 200. Who knows? Um, you just can't. Dorian, man, weighed like 250 or something. It's tough to put on the Mr. Olympia stage two people together like that. One guy's teeny. The other guy's huge. You're like, there's your Mr. Olympia. Like, yeah. the teeny guy? Like, that's yeah, tough. So... Uh, there is that was probably the last time I saw anything super super controversial. Short of that, like it's it's, it's kind of it's pretty obvious when when people win or there's obviously placings lower or down where you could have flip flop two people. But a lot of times the judges will admit it. The judges will after be like, I, I had this guy in seventh. He took eighth. I easily can see the the argument for eighth and seventh. Yeah. It's it's tough. But yeah. uh, people always talk about like oh like this guy got robbed. You're like. I, I used to be like, oh, really? I'd look it up and be like, I don't think that's true. So. Yeah, uh, I totally feel you. Again, your like subjectivity is always bound to come into it so, to a certain extent. I know some classes are worse than others for, I guess they're just inherently a little bit more subjective, like uh, a men's physique or bikini or whatever, some of the female classes potentially. I know I had Holly Baxter on. I think she did the WMBF. And the head judge was like, I preferred you when you were blonde. That really, I think, worked against you here. And she was just like, ah. <laughs> I like brunette. <laughs> that is actually fucking insane. And because that's not in the judging criteria. Um, it is actually, actually totally wild. Um, you won't see shit like that in the NPC, I'll tell you that, or the IFBB, like, straight up. Like, but the guys don't even have hair half the time. And, yeah. the, you know, the, the there's a, with the bikini girls, it is definitely also a beauty contest. But I don't think it's specific enough for hair. I don't think there's any judge who, like would ever say that, even if they thought it. Um, also, in you know, even in a bikini, when you see the champion, you're like, uh, I get it. Most of the time, yeah. Um, in those, in those, it, there definitely is more subjectivity. I will say though, there is absolutely a more scandalous placings in those classes every now and again that people don't agree with. But I think it's like one out of 10 times it's scandalous. Nine out of 10 times when people say, oh, what's her name got robbed? They actually don't understand the judging criteria of the class. Like they'd be like, this other girl was way leaner. You're like, yeah, in bikini, if you're too lean, they dock you points. And it's not controversial. It's in the rules. <laughs> so they, it's just a very specific look. And that makes it an unbelievably difficult sport. This open men's bodybuilding is, is the most straightforward shit in the world. Yeah. Just get as shredded as you can, lose as little muscle as you can, pose competently, the cards fall where they may. 
That's it. With with women's divisions, oh my god, bro! I would hate to. I would be like being a bikini girl, the hardest thing in the world. They're looking for you to be lean but fresh looking and not tired, bro. You ever seen an IFB pro's face on stage? <laughs> yeah. Like Big Robbie looks like he's half dead, and then his body looks like he's a god, and you're like, oh, he had to be judged on his face. He would be like eight yeah. or some shit. So it, it is really a trip for for women to have to go through that sort of thing. And, the thing is, is it's supply and demand, and uh, that's what people want to see. And before anyone says anything, I'm, feel free to get in the comments, but uh, it's not the patriarchy. The women themselves want to look like this. The overwhelming majority of women who are fans of bikini like the look that bikini has. And they don't want the overly dry, insanely crisp look. They don't want an overly muscular look. They don't want overly androgenized look because there's other divisions for that. You know, they yeah. can always do women's physique where they reward much more gnarly look. And actually, I, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I really haven't minded at all. And in some ways, really like the direction that the women's side of the sport has taken in recent years, because there's a spectrum of however, whatever choices and trade-offs you want to make as a woman, you can feel free. There's a place for you. There's bikini. There is uh, wellness. There is figure. There is women's physique. And then there's women bodybuilding and like you could, it's really just how much gear you're taking spectrum, right? <laughs> In some sense, but it's also like, look, if you just want to be fit and healthy and awesome and pretty and hot and all that other bullshit, bikini's great. If you want like a lot more muscle, but you still don't want to have like a super jack gnarly upper body and you want your looks to be judged a bit wellness. And, and if you want to be like goddess energy, goddess body figure, if you want to be like, like a classic eighties bodybuilder look, but ultra shredded and lean women's physique. And if you want to be a fucking she Hulk, which is a fucking cool look by itself, then you go into open women's bodybuilding. And it's like something for everyone. And a lot of people are like, man, there's all these new classes. Like, shut up. <laughs> like, does it bother you when you sit at home and do nothing with your life? You know what I mean? Like there's all these like, like armchair critics. It's like, look, are they giving out too many Olympia trophies? So many that you haven't won any? Exactly. <laughs> So I, I like I like when there's multiple classes of stuff. It's all different kinds of look. I, in the men's division too, um, the only thing I'll say is the uh, men's physique confuses me because I don't understand the board shorts. I don't understand that there's no weight cap. Like a real men's physique competitor at the Olympic level is fucking enormous. They're bigger than the classic physique guys. And I'm like, what is, what is it? And they all have legs that are like decent yeah. sized, at least some of them amazing legs. And you're like, what, what is this board short shit? Now it's a great look. Those guys are the, they're awesome. These, these are the guys that have some of the best genetics in the world. And at the end of the day, most people who work out kind of want to look like them the most, but I would actually just, uh, it's totally cool that the class exists, but I wouldn't be so uninterested in seeing that class get dissolved completely. And then you have, uh, the division that is classic physique get expanded more, become more competitive, and also potentially give those guys sort of more height and weight class flexibility, just kind of different looks to it. I think that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I, the board shorts thing, I don't really super understand. And the fact that there's no weight cap uh, it really rewards a very interesting approach to things. But if they all have amazing looks, it's just, I guess, in a certain sense, I want to see like Brandon Hendrickson or whatever, like train his legs for three months and then put on the classic physique trunks because he's gonna he would smash he's unbelievable You're like i want to see him up against yeah. bumstead man like uh, and then and so there's kind of something to that where I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the point of that class is but it's it's definitely great that at least um classic physique exists uh, for, for men because uh it is distinctly different than open bodybuilding and that's a good thing um i don't have the genetics to ever be in that class but I think the guys in that class, they have an amazing look. I mean, if you ever see like a few of those guys in person training at a gym, you're just like, what is that? Like when Jared Feather trains at any gym in the world and he's relatively lean, you just see people be like, oh, dad, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> when your arms are about the size of your waist, your people just just lose it. Now, I have a cool look, uh, but more like, you know, like if, if a human in a tank made love and there was a child <laughs> that... Yeah, that's a cool look for some people, but there's something really special about the aesthetics of it. Like yeah. the, the classic shots that Chris Bumstead hits, 
the, especially like the side swivel, this bullshit. You're just like, God damn it. You look like a bodybuilding trophy. There's something really there that's special in, yeah. in a different way than Ronnie Coleman or Big Rami and then all those other guys. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you on those points with, uh, I think if there's going to be different categories, they need to be different, a different enough, like yes. actually a different look, not just uh, we've got board shorts on you to make it and pose you different so that it is, so you actually are different. Otherwise you could just be in these other classes. So it's 100%. like people talk about classic being in like natural bodybuilding. It's like a good classic bodybuilder will just be a good open bodybuilder. But yes. I think, I do think if they want a softer look, then I can understand it to a like more of an extent because like to get gnarly shredded, maybe someone doesn't want to do that part. So then at least it is different. But if you're just as shredded as the guys in open, I'm like, if you're winning classic, you're winning open. <laughs> yeah. In drug free bodybuilding, drug free classic bodybuilding, you're right, makes absolutely no sense. It's like there's just one class. You know, I'll also say this. Um, well, to a large extent, drug so drug free bikini makes sense drug-free figure wellness and women's physique could be combined into one class it's different posing it's a slightly different look but tbh like there could just be two classes for natural females bikini and you got as jacked as you possibly could which if you're natural and you're as jacked as you possibly could you're like a blend of three categories and it's, it's a, it's a great look. It's a phenomenal look, but distinctly different from the bikini look because bikini girls intentionally aren't trying to get as jacked as possible. And like, uh, you know, not that anyone needs to hear this, um, total personal preference for me. And, and the caveat is here is like, I got a ton of respect for everyone. And, um, when I see a bikini girl at a gym and I've seen like a trillion of them, uh, training a dragon slayer and shit like that. Um, I'm like, uh, dope, that's like a really hot ass girl that's like, looks like, you know, the kind of look that everyone kind of wants to look like, I guess, as a female. But to me, something about a muscular woman is special. Something special about jacked. Like when a girl has some traps, you're just like, ah, oh, that's what's up. And it's not even, it's not remotely sexual. It's just like, it's just cool. It's like Wonder Woman vibes, you know? Uh, and uh, to me, there's something different about bikini that's cool in its own way uh because i think you know the average person that works out would see a bikini model and be like ah oh, this is kind of what all women aspire to like yeah there's there's another way to go there you know that's like more more jacked and uh, i think it has its own special appeal so you know the two classes for women uh at least make the most sense and, and you could even do that on the you could potentially do that on the ifbb but i think there is enough difference between all the classes though i will say figure versus wellness sometimes i actually have no idea which one i'm looking at very very similar do you not see the progress you would like are you sick of writing your own programs or perhaps you need some accountability in order to stick with the plan then it's time to start working with us. We at Revive Stronger offer a truly personalized coaching service. You'll get more than just an email with some macros or random cookie cutter program. With Revive Stronger, you will be the center of our attention. You will receive your own fully individualized training protocol alongside a customized nutritional strategy. We create the coaching around your needs, wants, personal preferences, and your own unique lifestyle. Every single week, we delve into your program in order to make appropriate adjustments so that we get the most out of your time and the best possible outcome. We help both female and male athletes to seriously change their body composition by adding more muscle mass and decreasing fat tissue. No matter if you're a competitive bodybuilder or just want to look better, if you need help with your progress and taking your physique to the next level, our coaching is for you. It's time to make a change, sign up today and let's revive stronger. Yeah, it's, uh, I think when there's, I don't know, more than a handful well i suppose there's a handful of classes but much more than like four classes i'm kind of like yeah. well i don't know why the women would need more classes than the men i like it just sure. just gets a little bit much but anyway okay. uh, that actually leads me on to a question that came in um and this was actually an interesting question he was asking uh, do you have any intention in talking more about drug use within bodybuilding it would be eye-opening for people to understand that a lot of people are lying about the dosages they use and that was kind of his, he was like, he would like you, he's got a lot of value from you talking about education in general across bodybuilding and would be interested in you going into more depth and I guess drug use and protocols and things like that. 
So uh, almost certainly not. And I'll tell you why. It's mostly just not that interesting to me. And you, you, you really can't fake interest, you know? Um, there, uh, so part one is just not that interesting to me. Um, to me, drugs are like a tool to, to get what I want out of my look. But I'm not, I'm not entirely fascinated with them. Uh, I'm not like, oh, what's the difference between like Masteron and Primo? I don't give a fuck, man. I use them for months at a time, make me look just about the same one way or the other. I can't really tell the difference. So, uh, you know, biochemistry doesn't fascinate me. Uh, none of that stuff. Um, that's part one. Part two is there are folks like Roderick Chavez and all his crew at Team Evil GSP. There are folks like, um, what's his name from England, Joe Jeffrey, and uh, tons of other people uh, that... There's another guy that's um, seemingly pretty good, Joe Sullivan's friend, Jake something or other. Anyone who knows can feel free to tag him or say that he'd... I've heard, I've heard very good things about him. And there's there's like, you know, at least five or ten other guys that are like... John Jewett they're just, hence, talks about it a bit. John Jewett, so John Jewett's more of a, a total package kind of guy. He's oh. not a specialist in the drug scene. But John's very competent as well. Um, but those guys are the people I listen to. And I, and I don't think I have much more to say than they do. I have like a less nuanced take than they do, a less informed take, a less insightful take, a take that like if I said something about drugs and then Broderick or Joe Jeffrey said something about drugs and you asked me, hey, who's more likely to be correct? I'd be like them. <laughs> so if I don't want to hear myself, anything that I speak about, I generally is, falls into one of two categories. One, it's funny. I think I'm funny about it. Two. I think I can take an authoritative stance that adds value to a conversation. Uh, and I make jokes about gear. There's only so many jokes you can make about gear. Uh, and then I don't think I can add much value in the conversation. So I just don't talk about it much because I, I just be I'd be rehashing some shit other people said. If I was to put my full intellectual weight behind it, I could disappear for two months and read tons of literature reviews. No doubt, I would come away with unique insights. But like. I don't give a fuck, man. I'm here in a couple, I'm last couple of years of my drug use anyway. As soon as I'm done with that shit, I'm never going to look back. What interests me more is actually new drugs that are non-anabolic, um, that are like, uh, for example, uh, things like monoclonal antibodies, uh, eventual like genome modifying agents and things like that. That's dope. That I'm going to get into hardcore as soon as I retire for bodybuilding. But uh, the the drug side is just not overly fascinating to me and then the whole thing and it was all due respect to the question asker there's a crap load of validity to what he's saying um a lot of people absolutely uh under exaggerate their dosages um a lot of people there's tons of fake natties around um but i just it's such old hat to me i've been training for 25 years i know it sounds like old. i've been training longer than you've been alive boy um sounds really old man type of shit to say but um i've been around the drug scene for basically 15 years a few of those i wasn't using and then after that but i was paying attention and then after that i kind of seen it all so like to some people it may be revelatory that people exaggerate or uh under um undertell how much drug they're taking but to me it's just like yeah that's how that it was in 2003 it's just like a sociological constant and it, to me a non-interesting one at that so when people come out and say like hey like this is what i use and you ask me like hey, is this really what they use my best answer is that fuck if i know <laughs> could be or it could, they could be a fucking liar um it generally I think it's getting better also, which is why another reason I'm not really pertinent, I don't think it's pertinent for me to say much on it, just getting better over time, guys are getting a little bit more open, um, or even if they're not, when they're open, they, they say things that seem to be quite reasonable. Like when a guy's like, yeah, I run a gram and a half of tats, then a gram of primo, and then a hundred megs of this, hundred megs of that, you're like, I don't think he's lying. I mean, it'd be a really interesting way to lie. It's like your real net worth is 10 million, but you tell people it's like 11.5. Like, really? Like, that's a strange flex, you know what I mean? So a lot of times now there's more, um, you know, somebody like, here's a good example, um, Jordan Peters. And I think a lot of this stuff happens in his private app uh, forum that he has in there, which I've heard is also great. But like, 
he'll he'll speak publicly about his dosages. And I'm like, I don't think he's lying. Like, it, he's it just absolutely does not have the demeanor of a liar. Now, I'm a fucking chump, and I've been done many times. People have lied to me, and I believe them. But my guess is he's being totally truthful. I mean, also, the dosages he's talking about, I'm like, I, I believe you. <laughs> like, I believe you. Uh, and, and, and so a lot of times, uh, it's just to me, it's just such old hat. You know, I'm like, yeah, guys lie about gear. They take more than they say. There's fake natties. I don't even know what I'm supposed to say about that. Um, I don't really do call out videos. There's enough people contributing to toxicity. Um, you know, like Scott, the video guy, and I will think like real talk, real talk. If I start coming after what I think are the claims by Derek Moore Plates More Dates and Greg Doucette and a few others that I think are false, um uh, my our YouTube channel is gonna bump up by hundreds of millions or hundreds of uh, thousands of subscribers over the six month period. I can riff, I'm funny, I can talk that shit. Um, you know, I'll call people out. I don't have any problem with face to face confrontation. Sure, shit, not with those guys. Why? <laughs> It'd be funny, but like, I think I have like a bunch of shit I want to teach people that's valuable. And then I could get into the insult game and natty or not. They're like, it's kind of a waste of my effort to some extent. I think people would be more thankful in five years for my educational stuff and my like, lighthearted self-effacing comedy then they would be like thank god mike's calling out those half natties but bro like everyone's a fucking half natty also one more thing while i'm ranting who gives a shit and i i mean that of course facetiously and comedically but there's a little grain of truth yeah. of like guys there's had there's fake natties out there like uh -huh. well what do you think about that like yeah i think they're there now, when you go to the gym and you train how the fuck does that impact you okay michael hearn's not natty and and then, and then they're like, well, he's telling kids, blah, blah. Okay, that's a fucking problem. But also, I would direct my attention to the kids. You'd be like, hey, kids, your favorite TikToker is probably a fucking idiot and is a fucking liar. Or he's a good person. We don't know. And you can't tell. So what you got to do is try to educate yourself as best as possible. Everything you do decision-wise about what goes into your body should be measured and reasonable and patient. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to put out into the world, uh, as opposed to just being like, this guy's a piece of shit and a fucking liar. Like, I just kind of obvious sometimes, and sometimes you can't even tell. People will be like, hey, do you think I, this, you think this guy's under uh, Simeon Panda? And you know who that is? Yeah. First of all, a hilarious name. Your last name is Panda. Yeah. That's funny. Um, but like, they're like, Simeon Panda can't be, can't be like uh, drug free. Like, I, I have two responses to that. One, it's totally possible he's using. Definitely. Two, and I think a lot of this stuff comes from Europe, uh, European people who aren't around African people much. We have a crap load of African Americans in the United States. I'm just going to say they're straight up. They're just better. It just, they're just better. And at a level that you can't comprehend until you see them in real life. Like, I've talked physically to people about drugs that are black dudes that have 20-inch arms and they're like 19 years old. And I'm like, blah, blah, this and that. And they're just a totally blank face. They're like, well, I don't know anything about that. And you're like, well, how's that possible? And it's true. There's tons of natty black dudes. They're just fucking black. And they fucking worked hard for five years. And then they look better than you'll ever look on any amount of drugs. And that's just a fact. There's, of course, genetic distribution is what it is. There's Asian dudes like that. How many drugs is Marvin the Martian on? Um, you know Marvin, Marvin uh, from course, Hong yeah. Kong. Like, yeah, like there's no drugs to take to make your glutes look like that. They don't have them. There's not a drug that does that. That's just Marvin. He just, he just has, he just 25,000 steps a day because he's fidgety <laughs> and somehow <laughs> has genetics to just get his face gets his, I've seen striations in his upper cheek. He explained that to me. That's not, that's not drugs, man. That's just him. And you know, there's like Jay Cutler. Jay Cutler claims to have gained 50 pounds of muscle in his first year of training. And you know what? I believe him. I straight up believe him. These cake colors built different. And then so people are like, oh, Simeon Panda's got to be on drugs. Like, you don't know that. It's just like African. That's just how he fucking looks, man. Um, so when you call out people for being on drugs, you don't even know if they're on drugs. It's just like a pretend fest. Like, that's yeah. half of Greg Doucette's videos. Like, is this guy on drugs? And even funny, to his credit, I can't believe I'm saying this. Uh, a lot of times, Greg Doucette would be like, is what's his name on drugs? And at the end of the video, I was like, I don't think so. And people were like, yo, Greg, I can't believe you sold out. He's like, no, and honestly, like, if you've been around really good athletes, 
do you know what's cap- what's possible drug free? It's scary. I, I I got into a ton of shit, not shit, but I got a ton of hate for a few years back. I remember Ray Williams and the USAPL, uh, yeah. they you know, squatted like a trillion pounds. Mm-hmm. I was like, I fully believe Ray Williams is drug free. And uh, people were like, are you fucking crazy? And I just wanted to be like, you guys just have no idea, like the, the fucking Wakanda depth of the fucking black race. Like, <laughs> you don't know. It's somebody has to tell you this is possible. And it's sure shit not possible for you, Mr. Five Foot Two Man in Luxembourg. <laughs> but it's sure, you know, some yeah. guy, Nigerian ancestry, like Nigerians, bro. Nigerians, period. It's real. And it, it, is, it is what it is. And some people just like, it's like an ontological shock. They can't, they're like, no, there's yeah. no way it's possible. And it's like, it is possible. It is unlikely. But then again, everything really impressive is by definition unlikely. Is it likely that another Ray Williams strolls around? Fuck no. Is it possible that Ray Williams is drug free? Yes, absolutely. And also, like he competes and passes a bunch of drug tests all the time. You look at his physique. There's something about your physique that says that you're on drugs. Chad Wesley Smith met Ray Williams a few times at a powerlifting meet, and Chad Wesley Smith is an enormous person. He was like Mike. Mike, he made me look like a child. Like <laughs> his his bones are just bigger. His hips are like the size of like a gargantuan overweight woman. But he's a man and they're made of muscle and not fat you know like like a person of walmart but like <laughs> it's just just nuts like there's no amount of muscle that you can put on a human being's body with hips like you know fuck it we'll just equalize the race flex wheeler his genetics if you cloned him and made him 23 years old again will never be as strong as ray williams because flex wheeler's hips are this big and ray williams hips are this big these just put more muscle on it. It's just pure leverage at that point. So people people forget that, and then you get the whole natty or not thing. So I'm just trying to steer clear of more or less all of that. Like, yeah, like, hey, is this guy on drugs? Like, yeah, maybe. But what if he's drug free? Yeah, maybe. A uh, conclusion of that. I think uh, to say what the kid's saying now, it's like natty cope is essentially what I think it becomes. And people just want to know that the reason they don't look like that person is because it's drugs and they want someone yeah. to, that they trust to say that that's the reason and they feel better about themselves. And I'm I'm glad you're not doing that content, even though it would propel you further. It'll probably bring a load of people that you probably wouldn't really want following. And I think it just tarnish, it would tarnish you. You wouldn't feel good about it. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I think it's good that you're not going down that route, to be honest. Yeah, the Natty, the natty Coke thing is really funny, Steve. Um, and at the end of the day, like there is a way to get around that. Um, you just gotta focus on yourself, man. It doesn't matter what else. Some uh, at the end of the day, like even if you're training for totally vain reasons, like you want to like pick up girls at the bar, you walk up to a girl. She doesn't care how you compare to other non-natty people. She just looks at you for what you are. And if you have a nice physique, she's like, "Yeah, let's go. You got a great body." And also, like, unless you're competing in bodybuilding and people who are on drugs are beating you, which I can understand getting pretty upset about, who gives a shit? Who cares? And also with the whole girls and society, most people think that Ronnie from Jersey Shore was too muscular. I mean, Steve, if we take you and put you, like, in a busy public swimming pool in America in the summer, people can be like, oh, my God, is that like Mr. Olympia or something? And for most girls, you're, like, entirely too muscular. They're like, ooh, I'm not into that look. You're like, the skinny hipster with faint four-pack is, like, peak attractiveness for guys. It really is. You think, oh, it's The Rock. Like, a lot of women think The Rock is handsome and and, and really, like, dapper or whatever. But the, the body by itself, they're like, oof, that's, oh, Jesus, that's a rhinoceros. You know, I'm not into all that. And there's tons of women that are. But it's just, like, this whole illusion that it's so easy to get caught up in, like, Reddit culture or YouTube culture where it's, like, you know, the gnarliest, most jacked guy. He's the guy cleaning up. He's also a CEO and he's tons of money. It couldn't be further from the truth. And and, and women and other men, fundamentally, very few people really care past a certain point how jacked you are. I wish that wasn't the case. I'm really jacked. I'd be swimming in the shit back in the day, uh, married man now. But, like, it was just that's just not how it works period what it reminds me of a like uh, there's memes or something along those lines where it's like you go to the gym to get jack to impress women and then all you do is you get compliments from other men that's quite literally (laughs) how it goes Uh, if compliments from other men were money i would be a billionaire if compliments (laughs) for women were money i would be begging in the street starving to death
<laughs> oh dear. So um, well, I, I wanted to touch on the education piece because I think that's a, a really big thing. I think just giving giving people awareness of like, I don't know, like what is possible naturally, what isn't, and just getting people to be skeptical and think about these things a little bit because there's there's even things like Photoshop. Like you just, you don't even know what people are doing to their images if they're being doctored or whatever. And then, like you said, focus on yourself. Like, well, what, is it going to change anything to your approach? Uh, hopefully not. So if you're enjoying it, have at it. One of my favorite interviews ever was on a documentary that I hope comes back onto Netflix or I'll just try to buy it on the internet. It was an interview like with a crap load of people from the Mossad, like the Israeli version of the Central Intelligence Agency. Or what do you guys have there? MI6 or whatever. Whatever, James Bond, you guys invented this shit. Yeah. So uh, they interview a crap load of like former Mossad agents, former directors of Mossad. It was really crazy. And one guy who was, I think, the former director of Mossad, or like the, the second in command, like who's really, like, this, these are people I can't even believe they got a camera to talk to. And they're asking him, the camera crew in the back, like, actively engages. Uh, like, you can hear them asking questions every now and again. Mostly it's just, they've already asked the question and the camera starts when he's answering it. But sometimes they do a little back and forth. And the guy sort of answers a question. And the guy behind the camera, he's like, I don't, I know that you're not just giving me like counter intel, like to throw me off. And the guy responds, he's like, how do I know if you're not an Iranian secret service agent? And he's like, how do you know? And the guy, the, the director of the side smiles and he goes, never can tell. And so to me, I was like, whoa, that's really like wisdom right there. You just like dealing with uncertainty is a fact of life. Sometimes you don't have enough uh, inferential power to make a concrete decision. And that applies to almost everything you see on social media. Look, look, if you see Branch Warren with the veins in his face, of course he's on fucking drugs, man. But like a lot of the people you see on social media, a lot of the people you see with their pictures, like, is it Photoshop? Is it doctor? Do they really look like that? Are they on drugs? Smile. You never can tell. Uh, sometimes you can tell, but a lot of times you can't. And then the, you have to ask the next sort of order question is why are you asking the question you don't have their genetics so people ask like what's possible for a natty it's a very fascinating intellectual question with almost zero relevance to anyone in the real world because steve you are not a natty you are steve hall your position on the spectrum of what is possible natty in the bell curve is somewhere on the bell curve it's not all over the fucking bell curve there's some fucking black dude in nigeria that can be natty 235 with strided glutes absolutely he's real and he's getting into bodybuilding tomorrow we will see him on stage in 2028 and everyone will say he's on drugs and he's really not but like if he gets popular which i hope he does and then people are like oh like you know people i see this on youtube they're coming like i love it man you're super inspirational you will show me what it's possible to be natty like no no no, no. impossible <laughs> but for one human being on earth yeah you took the very wrongest implication you know what i mean like that's funny it's, yeah it's, it's 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 like watching like an elite delta force sniper like ping fucking targets with an iron sight at 200 meters out over and over and you're like you really show me what's possible and shooting like no motherfucker you will never be that good maybe one out of a thousand of you watching his seminar will be 10 percent as good in 10 years of training do not like the idea that you're like oh you show me what's possible like possible but possible for you was a very different thing at the end of the day you have your own genetics your own life history your own challenges only thing that matters is your journey you're starting somewhere and you have this hazy idea of maybe what you could be and i would say just keep that idea real moderate 10 pounds leaner four or five pounds more muscular after a year or two when you get there look up a little further up the mountain and say what can i have that's a little bit higher eventually you'll be jacked and shredded and eventually you'll hit that sort of plateau where you're like oh i guess this is what i'm gonna look like you know um this is kind of my sort of peak conditioning like right now i'm 30 almost 38 years old no almost 39 yeah, i'm 38 almost 39 years old i turned 39 like in a month and um like you know, I'll get a little bit more muscular, more lean, but I'm absolutely not willing to take any more gear to, to get much more muscular. This is kind of like I'm very close to my peak lifetime appearance. I'm like, it's been such a fascinating and fun journey to find out where I ended up. But like, I didn't end up looking like Flex Wheeler. I didn't end up looking like Big Rami. And I ended up bigger than a lot of pros, actually, and leaner than some of them. And it's like, that's really cool. But also, if I was like, I want to look exactly like Kevin LeBron. 
the fuck would that give me? I'm never going to look like him. All the proportions are off. There's nothing to do about it except get a little closer and just be grotesquely disappointed. So when people say like, oh, I love looking up to XYZ Lifter because he shows me what's possible for an Addy, like you have, miscon you have misconceptualized the question altogether. And there's the other side of the coin too, where guys will get on gear because they're like, oh, I want to look like Ronnie Coleman. Motherfucker, are you out of your mind? Everyone that's ever been on gear wanted to look like Ronnie. You know how many people have done it? Big Robbie, one person, <laughs> the rest failed. Like, it's just a matter of fact. So I'm really, really big on that. If you can't tell the personal journey and, yeah. and the small and moderate victories, moving your line just a little further for you, comparing your old pictures to your new pictures, being really happy with how you look and your progress. Because at the end of the day, what can people say? They could say, oh man, your legs are really small. They're like, oh yeah, like uh, they're bigger than they used to be. And uh I know I don't have great genetics for big legs, but like, I'm trying my best. What is the response to that? There is no response to that other than that. I feel you, you know? So this whole idea of being inspired by someone because you look at them and they look cool and you're like, oh, just it's awesome that someone can do that. I think that's amazing. But being inspired by someone and being like, I want to look like that and I plan on it. You're like, dude, are you crazy? Don't do that to yourself. You're setting yourself up almost for for failure and another problem is a lot of people who get to that top tip top who look up to heroes and eventually become as good or better than them you'll see their interviviews and they're like oh i saw you know samir Banu, the 1982 mr olympia and i knew i wanted to look like that and eventually like i beat everyone you're like yeah that's a one in a million case it's mathematically setting up almost all of us for failure if you think like that yeah. it's just a little food for thought on that you know what i mean steve it's it's just uh, crazy to me that people still think like that yeah, for sure. It's uh, one of my least favorite questions is from a client. It's like, like, where will you expect me to be in like six months time or a year's time well, or something like this? Let me get like my this. fucking crystal ball out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, put in your best efforts. We'll kind of get what we can from the situation. Get We're going to get the most from it. And it's similar if I've had clients who have been like, I don't know, they, they send me a photo of someone they want to look like or they aspire oh, to. And I'm like, no. It's, it's cool to have aspirations, but you have oh, like, Again, like you said, you're a completely different human. You have no idea if you're going to be able to look like that. You could look better than that person. But normally people pick out people who are kind of top tier genetics. So it's unlikely that's the case. <laughs> Steve, I, um, Nick Shaw and I were personal training in New York. Like, she's at this point, 10 plus years ago, 15 years ago, 15 years ago. And I had a woman who was at the time in her mid 50s tell me she wanted to look who at the time was in her mid thirties, I guess, Jennifer Lopez. And I was like, uh, how do I say this? You know? And I ended up being like, you know, we're going to try to make you look like the best version of you and we'll see how that goes, which is, you know, I think with my best answer that I could have given and continue to give in that scenario. But it was wild to me that this is a very competent, very intelligent adult woman. And, the, and, and I mean, this is all, again, all due respect, I'm just, just, just joshing for conversation here. Everyone says weird shit sometimes be the most, the most than anyone. Um, how the fuck does that shit leave your mouth? Like, are you serious? Uh, or is that how you think it works? You know what I mean? Like, that's like, it's like coming to a financial advisor and he's like, what, what are you thinking? What is your plan? You're like, I, I kind of want to go like Elon Musk kind of route. You're like, <laughs> yeah. all right. How many societally altering inventions do you have in your back pocket? Like, well, uh, not a ton. Like, oh, I got you. You know? So it's just, it's just wild to me that that was even a, a possibility for a very competent adult woman to think. So when people say that, I don't really judge them harshly. When you're 15 years old, you're like, I want to look like Chris Bumstead. Like a uh, word up, uh, there's you know there's a that analog happens in a lot of sports. Uh, you know I'm a jujitsu competitor and uh, there was a, I rolled with a girl once actually who was very young and she was like 16 years old. You know open mat like you roll with everyone uh, and so I smashed her to bits. I'm kidding, of course I think went super easy and, and stuff. She beat me a lot and I remember like uh, she was like nervous and I was uh, chatting her up a little bit. And I was like, well, what got you into this? And she's like, I want to be just like Ronda Rousey. And I was like, that's really cool. Because you're 16. I'm not going to be like, well, it's intellectual. It's unlikely. And I was like, oh, that's yeah. dope. Well, welcome to the sport. But uh, 
you know, it's funny because Ronda Rousey in retrospect was like a huge asshole too. It's like, you don't want to be like Ronda Rousey. Ronda Rousey is a mean person. <laughs> and, 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 and also, you know, you're probably not going to be like her. I'm not here to clip your wings though. Um, and it's like when someone's 16, there's somewhere between an adult and a child. Like when yeah. an eight-year-old says like, I want to be like Superman, you're not like, well, kid, people don't fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, yeah, I love Superman. That's probably the best response. But it was kind of, it was kind of trippy to see that. And it happens a lot in all sorts of, uh, almost every regard. Like it's cool to have heroes, but I think when you grow up, you change your perspective to, and I'm really inspired by this person. Yeah. Versus I want to become them or something like them. And it's funny enough, Jared, who has the best genetics of any of my close friends at the very least, Jared Feather, um, he never really had, he had only inspirations in his life. He never had people he wanted to be like. Um, he's actually been on podcasts where people are like, who's your, like, who, whose physique do you most want to emulate? He's like, I've never had that thought go through my head. Well, yeah, if I looked like Jared, I probably wouldn't either, you know, but uh, yeah. it could. But Jared used to be a skinny kid with just really good lines, but he's still just, I look at old pictures of Jared now and I was like, he really emaciated fuck. Thank God somebody <laughs> fed you. He like, looks like a puppy, like the bones are big, but there's nothing on him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but like at, at the end of the day, like he never even had that proclivity to really I, try to idolize people in the sense that you want to be like them. And I think that's very healthy. Yeah. No, I, I think that's great. And I, I love it when you actually, uh, I think we've spoken about it before, where you've had that perspective of like your own journey, because uh, uh, like it speaks to me a lot, because unlike Jared, I have definitely looked up to physiques. I know Matt Ogus was like one of the ones who I was like, I want to look like Matt Ogus. Yes, and you great. slowly, yeah, exactly. So you, you slowly realize kind of that's not necessarily possible. I think the worst of it is, it's like you said, as a child, you're kind of like told anything is possible, put your mind to it. Oh, but then God. you will get people even who are at the top of their game and they will say that they will legitimately think that they have just got to that point that they're at elite through hard work and effort. And if you do that too, you'll get there. And then that's what frustrates me because I'm just like, you're full of shit. <laughs> like, no, there's no way I'm going to be Usain Bolt. <laughs> right. But they, they're not, a lot of those guys aren't even like consciously full of shit. They're not lying. They think that's the truth because sure. they did it. Like rappers and or people getting awards at award shows, like crying, like I just want everyone out there to know I'm struggling. Anything is possible. <laughs> and everyone's like, "Oh my god, it's so inspirational!" It's like, all right, well, certainly defying the laws of thermodynamics is possible. We'll start out with one easy one, <laughs> yeah. and then probabilistically, there's a whole host of things that are not impossible but insanely unlikely. Uh, so it, it's, um, that I, it was just at a random, I suppose, related tangent here. The idea that the telling someone like, uh, you can be anything you want to be is, um, it's such a great karmic place to come from advice wise. It's such a beautiful thing to say to someone and it's so well meant, you know, but it's also so fucking wrong that you're like, God. Ah, Damn it, I wish you would have said something really similar, but different enough for them to get some wisdom out of it instead of just nonsense. Um, and, you know, if I was ever asked, like, you know, you know, what can I, can I be anything I want when I grow up or whatever? I would never voluntarily go out of my way to say something like that to someone. But like, you know what? If you put a lot of effort and intelligence and time and resilience into something, you can ascend to far greater heights than you could ever imagine. But that's that's inspirational as fuck, right? Sounds inspirational to me. Uh, but like anything you want to be, like uh, there's you know like there's other people that have better genetics than you, even for hard work, and they're out there. Like there's that one Korean dude who's like a NASA astronaut, and a PhD in chemical engineering, and he's like a former Navy SEAL sniper all at the same time, and a, or like a medical doctor or some shit. And that guy exists. He's better than you at everything. Like, what's going to happen when you run into him and you wanted to be him, but he's better? You're not as good. So, and there's all these uh, stories, of course, of, uh, you know, every generational champion, like a Michael Jordan, overshadowed dozens of people who could have been him, but for him being there. I mean, Scottie Pippen would have been the best guy in the Chicago Bulls for a generation, if not for Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan's out there somewhere, and you might not be him. As a matter of fact, you're probably not him. So all you can realistically do to continue to keep that fire burning inside of you, but also at the same time not set yourself up for an insane disappointment where you have to reshift your focus, is you know 
you can probably go really far if you push yourself and if you stay dedicated and so far that you'll very pleasantly surprise yourself. And that's true with most people, because I think most people discount how much time and intelligent effort really adds up. You know, they'll train for six months and they'll be like, oh, like, that's pretty good. You, know, you have no idea how deep that well is. Steve, if you saw yourself in your current shape after your first six months of training, you'd probably pass out. Yeah. You'd be like, my arms are the size of like, I don't even know, most people's legs. It's insane. So like, did you think you could get arms that big when you started? Realistically, like, you're like, fuck no. So look how far you've come. Look how far a lot of the people we know um, have come. Imagine, you know, Pascal at his worst out of shape. And now he looks like a stud. He probably never thought he was going to look like that. So there's a ton of beauty to that without yeah. making like statistically uninformed at best statements of you can be anything you want. Like there's no need to say that to someone. There's better ways to say it. Um, it's similar to the fact that like there's people give like love and relationship advice. Like, you know, if you really like someone, you know, if you're persistent enough, they'll come around. Like, isn't that really violating the whole Me Too yeah. movement? <laughs> like, and some people just don't like you. And it has nothing to do with how good you are or awesome you are. It could just be like a sense of humor alignment. Like to cut myself some slack. Like, I'm pretty funny on average. People, enough people have told me that, that I'm like, oh, okay. a lot of people think I'm funny. But like, I'll be funny in front of people, like random people or even people I know well. And this is like dead man, just nothing. <laughs> and what am I supposed to be like? Oh, no, 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 no. If I'm funny enough, I could get everyone. No, some people just don't think I'm funny. Like, I don't think I'm funny half the time. Like, yeah, that was a shit joke. People are laughing at it. I'm like, if I was in the crowd, I would laugh at that stupid <laughs> shit. Can't believe I even said that. So it, a lot of times it's kind of that whole, like, you could have it all. It's like, there's, you don't have to have it all. You have to have your best version of what you're capable of. And if you put in time and effort, you're going to have a lot of really great stuff. Isn't that good enough? Yeah. Yeah, I think oh, that's so well said because I think it, it, it just sets people up for failure, absolutely, and always being dissatisfied. Whereas, like I have, like yeah. you said, you kind of, after having done it for over a decade now, I'm like, I, I'm in a position of a, a level of muscularity that I never thought I'd get to. And I'm at a level of competitiveness within natural bodybuilding I never thought I'd be able to get to. I'm thinking of achieving things that I never thought would be possible for me. And that's a really cool thing. And it's also a bit, I don't want it to sound like people can like give up on their goals or not work as hard for it, but it's kind of a bit of a relief to know, oh, I shouldn't have aspirations to be like the elite of the elite. I can, or have expectations, sorry, to be the elite of the elite. But if I put my best efforts, like I'll, I'll get what should come to me versus like, if I get something that's coming to me and it's not that, then I have disappointment. So I, I think that's a great message. Dude, totally. Um, I've been uh, chatting recently with uh, Alex Hormozzi. Do you know who that is? I follow Alex. I've listened to a few yeah, yeah. of his podca yeah. oh, podcasts he's been on. Yeah, him and Layla are super great people. Uh, and one thing that he told me, which I, I, I should have known, but I really like when he told me, and we had a conversation about it a few times. Um, and I think he, he's mentioned it on our podcast too, but hearing it directly from him as like a human being off camera is interesting. Because he's like, he's publicly, his net worth is over $100 million, right? And you know, that's like a preposterous amount of money. And he's like, dude, uh, you just get into a different pool of people, and then you're the poorest person in that pool. Because people are like, yeah, I bought a 747 and gutted it out, and now it has 10 jacuzzis. And you're like, I can't even afford half a 747. Like, what the hell am I? You know, like, like uh, one of the guys in his building uh, that he regularly sees in the elevator, and they say hi, is a billionaire. Like, he's like, oh, like people, are, oh, we've heard of Alex Ramosi, he's rich. And if they told, if that guy was in the elevator with Alex and, and the billionaire guy, and he's like, oh my God, Alex Ramosi, like, oh, I love your stuff. You're so rich. You're so amazing. You know everything. The billionaire would be like, oh, that's cool. And Alex would be like, oh, don't worry about him. I'm just, you know, like, I'm, no, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I don't even know how to make any money as far as you're concerned. So there's always levels to the shit. Yeah. And you can always find a way to be really, really pleased with how far you've come. Um, you can find a way to keep some neutrality if you're into that sort of thing, like not be too impressed with yourself. It's some, in some elements, that's very healthy. And you can absolutely always find a way to be disappointed with what you've done. And it doesn't even matter what you've done. So I'll do a quick intellectual exercise. Um, just in the sport of bodybuilding, let's say, if you win a show you haven't won nationals 
If you win nationals, but you don't get a pro card, you don't have a pro card. If you win your pro card, then you ain't shit because there's tons of pros that are better than you. You haven't even entered your first pro show. You enter your first pro show and you get like 12th. Oh my God, you're at the bottom of the world. Now remember, everyone who has won their first show at the regional level looks to you as a god and you look at yourself as a total piece of shit <laughs> who doesn't even deserve to be a pro. You win your first pro show and people are like, you know, you're in your own head, people or whatever, people say all kinds of stuff. But uh, in your own head, you're like, well, I haven't won Mr. Olympia. You win the Mr. Olympia and you're like, it was a fluke. It was a one-off. You win two and you're like, I'm not like the guys that have won three plus. You win eight and you're just tied with Ronnie Coleman and Lee Haney. I got so let's go further. You win nine, which no one's ever done. Well, Linda Murray won like 10 or whatever. Iris Kyle won like 18 or some shit. And um, you go... Someone could still come in in my lifetime and win 10, and I will not be able to die happy as being the greatest ever. And if for shits and giggles, if you for sure are the greatest ever and you're 80 years old at this point, you're on your deathbed and you have 12 Olympias and the recent up and comer who's the stud has like three and he just tore his quad. So, you know, he's not that he's not, it was actually you're on your deathbed and he has three. So by definition, you're going to die and be an immortal champion for at least the next whatever, six years. You could be on your deathbed and think I made my entire life's purpose to do this. There are scientists out there curing world hunger leaders making world peace and I flexed my muscles? What the fuck? Pessimism is a never-ending road. Comparisons that are negative and toxic, there is, no, there is no end to that stuff. Let's say you do the ultimate and you become a universe-creating god. At the end of the day, you could be like, so what? All right, I'm the man. Great. It's just an attitude. Meanwhile, the kid with fucking Down syndrome that just got a job at Walmart and did his first day and everyone thinks he did a great job is the happiest person in the world, deservedly so. It's just all up here. It's always been yeah. all up there. So it's like you you know this. You might as well get to work. And attitudes are adjustable. There's a big genetic component. There's a big historical component for how you're raised and what life circumstances you had. But at the end of the day, you have, there's some fungibility there. And you can choose to see things from a more positive perspective or a more negative perspective. And that whole thing of comparing yourself to others, why don't I look like the trend twins or whatever the fuck, uh, that is a road to not nowhere. It's a road to a very predictable place, uh, which is not happiness. It is not fulfillment. It is the opposite of all those things. So if you want to really enjoy the shit out of your life, look amazing, make tons of progress and be happy, a lot of that is going to be based on what your work effort. And what you do physically, how much you know, food you eat and weights you train with and starvation you impose on yourself. But a lot of it will be straight up mental work, just mindset. No, I will be fucking grateful for this bullshit. My wife and I actually, a few nights a week, we sit down at the end of the evening. We have like a gratefulness discussion. We put it in our notepads to do our to do. It's on our to do list. This is so important. We have to be grateful for stuff. And really sit back and be like, God damn, like we really did a lot of really great stuff. And we we should be grateful for it. Because what are you if you don't smell the roses on your own little version of victory, what the fuck is the point? Like, can you imagine, like, oh hey, congratulations, you won the Mr. Olympia? Like, oh thanks. Like, oh, oh, okay. If it's not happiness for you, what the fuck does it matter? Yeah. I think that's really well said. And I've kept you long enough, Mike. And actually, that leads really nicely into something I was going to talk about anyway was your new channel, which is uh, oh, ma I making you were progress, promote right? Something else. I, I'm going to promote that as well. But because uh, <laughs> that, that discussion to me led so nicely into that philosophy channel, I guess. So, yeah, I wanted to make people aware of that because uh, I've definitely seen it as we've spoken more and more. You've gone more into those kind of philosophical discussions and uh, i haven't checked any of them out but the first one was interesting to, well, i haven't checked it out yet but it's an hour-long video on the purpose of life so it sounds like a video i'm gonna need to watch so yeah. I'm, I'm actually youtube looking forward to age that. restricted it and i have oh, no really? idea why no clue why there's nothing in there that should be age restricted but we appealed and they denied the appeal but i don't think any human beings ever looked at it but uh yeah, so good luck. You got to sign in to watch it. it. Makes it salacious. It's gonna be really disappointing. So, who is age restricted? You listen to the whole hour. You're like, <laughs> what? I remember I listened to your. You had like a debate on veganism, and you went into like you just have a way of thinking about things that I don't think some people have 
like thought about such as like the intelligence of different animals and that sort of aspect of veganism which i thought was i just find that very interesting so yeah i'm interested to dig into that so i wanted to give that a shout out i'll make sure that's a so link much. below but the other one is the uh, seminar that we're running on the well i call it a seminar the uh, couple of training days deal. by the time this video comes out uh, it will be live. People can pick up tickets or get spots, and well, maybe they'll all, all have gone by the time this comes out. Hopefully, a bunch uh, of them probably <laughs> will. They typically go real fast. The VIP, it's all VIP this time, basically, right? Exactly. And the VIP spots always disappear quick. So you know, get over there and buy it and give us money. God damn it! Steve also needs a Lambo. For the love of God, <laughs> I can't be the only Lamborghini collector out here. <laughs> hey, you would be the five hundred thousandth person to have Lamborghini in London. <laughs> Oh, that would be amazing. I do need my Lambo. So that's the 9th and 10th of September if there are any spots left. But like Mike said, these ones always sell out really quickly. And, and that's why we wanted to do two days of the, basically VIP treatment because we wanted more people to be able to experience that. So very much looking forward to that and connecting with people and taking people through some hard training sessions. Yeah, just to clue people in and if you click on the link, you'll, you'll, there's all this is written up for you in detail it's not just going to be like you like show up and hear a lecture from a few of us and then you go home it's going to be an intimate experience of like we're going to be training together and myself and jared and nick shaw and pascal and steve and a few other folks we will be torturing you in a in a very small group training session where it's just you and a few other people and us and we're going to cook your ass and you're going to be able to pick up a ton of cues and tips to take home with you. It'll be one of the best workouts you've ever had in your life. It is a truly, truly special thing. Only because I feel special. It's always really awesome for me to be able to be like in the real world with people. Because I talk a lot of shit on YouTube and you and I are on YouTube for forever. But like there's a different thing about reality. And, and if you've ever watched our YouTube videos where like on our channel, we take a bunch of pros through workouts. And you're like, whoa, that looks fascinating. Like. It's going to be the same thing. And P.S., we're bringing Scott the video guy. So you will be on YouTube. Like, it's you will be that person. And for just one easy payment of a trillion dollars, you can get your ticket. <laughs> it's all we're asking for. It's what is money anyway? It's just pieces of paper, right, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> you could be gone tomorrow. I know that. I was hit by a van and I survived, but you might not. So you might as well just spend all your money <laughs> on, the, on the best, best training session of your life. <laughs> best sales pitch I have ever heard. Listen, can you take your money to the grave? No. Can you take your money to Steve and Dr. Mike so they can train you? Absolutely. Guaranteed even. <laughs> and like you said, it's torture. So they might end up just wanting to call it all their quits. They aren't even willing to go through the whole workout. So you might as well spend all your money money well spent <laughs> bring all of your money and we'll see you there with your money if you don't have money you literally we can't physically see you steve and i don't <laughs> see in the visual spectrum we see in the money spectrum we actually only see your wallet and then what is the what is the what are pounds do you guys even have bills anymore what are what are the pounds what are the bills colored because american dollars are green do you guys hey, have different colors or? they are different colors a 10 pound note is red i don't have uh what is I think you don't blue deal with less than 20? 10 pound notes, do you? <laughs> no, no. What is it? Was it 20 quid? Is that what it's called? 20 quid, yeah. <laughs> 20 quid, yeah. Look, I just see blue notes, baby. I see only shades of blue. So show up with money. You can show up without it. And I just literally would be like, where are you? I can't train you if I can't see you. <laughs> very well said. So yeah, we're very excited for that. We're excited to see all you, all of you there. Like Mike said, that's going to be linked in the bio. And as always, thank you very much for tuning in. And we'll catch you on the next one. Take care. Losing weight fast while maintaining muscle mass. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It isn't though, it's reality and we know how to do it and we will help you achieve this. The Minicup Movement is an eight week fat loss program to make you lose a huge chunk of fat while maintaining muscle mass at the same time. We will support you from the beginning to the end so that you see the results you would like to and come out of it much stronger. You will receive a fully automated spreadsheet that is based on your nutritional needs. You can choose between six different male and female training templates. Over 30 videos will guide you through each and every single step of the mini cut so that you're getting the most out of your journey and that you always know what to do. But the best thing is that you can start whenever you want. The mini cut movement is open 24 seven. So if you want to learn more or you're ready to sign up, hit the link in the description below. So let's revive stronger together.